I want to tell you a story of friendship, a friendship forged during one of the worst battles of World War II. I wish I could remember the figure I ran across in researching something else this week. Uh, there's not that many, vet, there's a smaller and smaller group of veterans alive from World War II. So uh, anyway, again, a friendship forged during one of the worst battles of World War II. It's a, and a promise made almost 60 years ago, a promise that was finally kept. Harold Huggins, a U.S. veteran of 10 major campaigns in World War II and the last survivor of his own battalion, traveled halfway across the United States by train on one last mission in memory of his best buddy. He says, I've had this on my mind for 67 years, trying to locate his sister and loved ones out there in California, says Huggins. Part of him lives in me. Huggins from Albany, Illinois, and Mac McLean from Marysville, California, were best friends in the Army. They wound up together on Anzio Beach, Italy, the scene of one of the bloodiest battles of World War II. Mac told Harold that he didn't think he was going to make it out of their lives, so he gave Harold some mementos, a belt, some photos, and said, give this to my sister, and please tell her that I love her. Huggins recalls, you can even give her a kiss. Harold promised that if anything happened to Mac, he would do what was asked. One day later, Mac was killed in an artillery barrage. After the war, Huggins looked for Mac's sister, but never found her until Harold's daughter sent out some emails to various veterans groups inquiring about Mac's relatives. Some Californian vet, California veterans found Mac's sister, Grace, whose last name had changed because she had married. We had always hoped and prayed that we would be able to meet somebody who would tell us about Mac, said Grace. On Thursday, August 2nd, 2001, at the place where his buddy's name is engraved in marble at the Veterans Memorial in Marysville, California, Harold Huggins kept the promise that he made 57 years earlier. He met Mac's sister for the very first time, gave her the kiss that Mac asked Harold to deliver, and entrusted to her the mementos from, his fa from her fallen brother and his friend. For an old soldier who wouldn't give up his search for a buddy long uh, but his long lost sister, there was a feeling of mission accomplished. That's a great story of a promise being kept, isn't it? But sadly, we're more accustomed in our lives to promises not being kept, aren't we? Yes, Dad, I, I promise to take out the trash. Maybe you heard that as a mom or a dad. This one's more current, I guess. If I'm elected, I promise to, and you fill in the blank. A lot of promises made during election season, right? Or maybe you've experienced this. I promise to love you forever till death do us part. Sadly, that promise isn't always kept either for one reason or another. Maybe you've heard this one. Yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, your money is safe with us. Promises, promises. That, that phrase brings up a country song in my mind I grew up hearing. Promises, promises, that's all I ever get. But you've heard promises that haven't been kept. Maybe you've made a promise you didn't keep in your life. Throughout the study of Abraham's life, and we've been at this a while, I know, but we've learned some things, hopefully. we followed the ups and downs Abraham encountered as his faith matured, and we've highlighted how we understand that in her own life. It hasn't always been pretty for Abraham and Sarah, has it? But through all the twists and turns, there has always been one constant, hasn't there? And that's the incredible, unwavering faithfulness of God. We've spent time talking about Abraham, and we've mentioned God as he's obviously an integral part of the story, but Let's focus on God today and His faithfulness. God's faithfulness is highlighted in our text from this, for this morning in Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. I've just picked a phrase from my version of Genesis uh, chapter 21. and I think it's verse 1 and 2. We'll get to it in a moment. But as part of the text there, it says, God did as He had promised. <laughs> 
And that's a short phrase, but it's full of, of so much meaning. Let's take a look at Genesis 21, verses 1 through 7, and see what we can learn today about the faithfulness of God. First of all, let's talk about the certainty of God's faithfulness. We just highlighted a lot of promises made that aren't kept in our life. But let's talk about the certainty of God's faithfulness. Verse 1, the text says, Then the Lord took note of Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah, as he had promised. Now again, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? God's promise of an heir for Abraham and Sarah had been woven has been woven throughout this story of his life from the beginning in Genesis chapter 12, hasn't it? At key junctures throughout this study, we've seen God, first of all, make the promise. I'm going to bless all nations through you, Abraham. Didn't say anything about a son at that time, but he says, you're going to be the father of a great nation, so you've got to have an heir to do that. But as time went on, At key instances, God would reaffirm that promise and more details were given as as time went on. But the most recent message, or mention rather, of this promise came back in chapter 18, two or three weeks ago. Genesis 18, verse 10. God said, I will surely return to you at this time next year and behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. We talked there about how God finally narrowed down the time frame. Within the following year, Sarah would have this child. Well, we're at that point in the story where it happens, just as God said. Again, verse 1, the Lord took note of Sarah, and the Lord did for Sarah. That's the certainty of God's faithfulness. What God says, He does. The Lord did as He said. And he did as he'd promised. Oh, that we would all be that faithful, right? To our word and our actions. But yet we fall short. But God never does. God is certainly faithful. And as we read on in the story, we learn that the certainty of God's faithfulness is emphasized by the timeliness of his faithfulness. The two are tied together. God's promises are certain, but as part of that, God keeps His promises on time. Verse 2 says, So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Once again, we can reference back to chapter 18 in that Pause in the story where God makes the promise. Genesis 18, verse 14, we read there, it says, uh, at, at that point, Sarah laughs at the promise of a son. And God makes this statement back in Genesis 18, 14. He says, he asks a question, first of all, he says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? At this appointed time, I will return to you, God says. At this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Of course, we're keying in here on this idea of timeliness. Sometimes we get around to keeping our promises, but sometimes it's long after we said when we said we'd do it. <laughs> we give the example of taking out the trash. Well, sometimes a kid, well, you know, I'll do it, Dad. I want it done now. I'll get to it. When the time came, though, for this fulfillment of God's promise, there was no thing or no one who was going to stand in the way. It was the appointed time. You see, the barrenness of Sarah's womb, and by the time of Genesis 18, by the time of this part of the story, Sarah had been barren, unable to have children for 90 years. That's a pretty good roadblock having a child, isn't it? But the barrenness of Sarah's womb was no barrier for God. As the text says, Sarah conceived when the time was right because God had promised that. 
The barrenness of Sarah's womb didn't stand in the way. The advanced age of Abraham didn't cause any problems for God. He's, he's 100 years old at, the, at this time. That's no barrier to God keeping His promise when He said He was going to do it. The point here is that when the time came for God to keep His promise, nothing could prevent it from happening. Nothing. Have you ever made excuses for not keeping your promise? Like I've made excuses sometimes for not keeping a promise on time? God doesn't need to make excuses because nothing prevents God from doing what He says on time. God had appointed the time of the fulfillment of the promise, and God keeps His appointments. This isn't in my notes, but I just thought of it. It's kind of the way a preacher's mind works. You're talking about something else, and you'll remember a verse. Uh, I think it's Galatians 4, verse 4. At the right time, Christ died for the godly, or for the ungodly, rather. When the time came for the Messiah to be sent, a promise God had made, by the way, guess what? The right time came and it happened because God made a promise. God keeps His appointments. So the certainty and the timeliness of God's faithfulness are unassailable. But what response does that prompt from our man Abraham? Verses 3 and 4, the response to God's faithfulness. On the heels of this amazing fulfillment, and Abraham and Sarah had waited a long time for this. It says, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah had bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old as God had commanded him. You see, God's faithfulness motivates Abraham to be faithful as well. Now, Abraham hasn't always been faithful. He's doubted God at some key points in this story. But God's faithfulness here motivates Abraham to act faithfully, doesn't it? The patriarch has had his issues with his own faithfulness, but the birth of the promised son at last promise, prompts immediate actions of faith on his part. Number one, he gives the boy the name God had wanted him to have, right? Back in Genesis 17, verse 19, God had said, No, your wife Sarah is going to bury you a son, and you will name him Isaac. The time has come for Abraham to make good on that, and he does it right away. Good for Abraham. Abraham isn't debating another name at this point. God's been faithful, so Abraham says, I, I want to be faithful. He also follows God's instructions concerning circumcision. We read that and studied that back in chapter 17 of Genesis as well. Verses 9 and 10, God had given the instructions for Abraham to circumcise his household, and he did it for those who were alive at that time, but the time has come now, eight days after birth, for this young son of promise to be circumcised. See, a faithful God seeks faithfulness from those blessed by his promises. In spite of his past failures, Abraham wastes no time now as he seeks to honor God by faithfully obeying his commands, right? Abraham did, as the end of verse seven or verse five, 4 says, as God had commanded him. That's the re proper response to the faithfulness of God, a willingness on our parts as God's children to faithfully do what he tells us to do. But the text ends in verses... Where are we at here? Whoops. Well, I did it this week too. You should have on your screen verses 5 through 7. But I'll... Oh, that is. Okay, I just didn't change the verses there. Got it. Let's finally talk about the joy over God's faithfulness. And it's a fitting end to this part of chapter 21. God's promises are certain. They're timely. And they prompt faithfulness on the part of those He blesses by keeping His promises. But note the joy that comes. Verses 5-7 through seven says, Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. 
once again, the improbability of this birth is brought to the forefront. We've seen hints of that throughout the story, haven't we? This truly is, humanly speaking, this was an impossibility. But an impossibility can't stand in the face of a promise of God. A a nomad here, that's Abraham, a hundred years old has become the father of a newborn son. What are the chances of that? Not very high. A 90 or 91 year old woman who has been barren her entire life has now given birth. No one expected this. Even those to whom the promise was made. Abraham and Sarah doubted it more than once. In fact, they laughed at it, didn't they? Remember, both Abraham and Sarah laughed in disbelief earlier at the prospects of this promise being kept. Genesis 17, verse 17 is when Abraham laughed. And Chapter 18, verse 12, was when Sarah laughed. So we've had laughter in this story before. The laughter of disbelief. Now, they're laughing for a different reason, aren't they? Their laughter is an overflow of the joy in their hearts at God's faithfulness in keeping His promise. In essence, as I read these words of Sarah in verses 6 and 7, It's almost as if they're saying, God did it. God did it. It's incredible. God's given us a child. Who would have said this could happen? They're overflowing with joy that this faithful God has kept His promises faithfully. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind us all this morning that we serve a God who keeps every single promise He makes. God keeps every single promise He makes. That's the definition of faithfulness. Even when it seems like there's too many obstacles in the way, God keeps His promise. Maybe you've had a time in your life where you say, Boy, the way things look here, God, I don't know how how you can do what you said you're going to do. I've made a mess of my life. There's too many obstacles, God. The God who can open the, the womb of a barren woman. The God who can make a man a father at age 100 isn't afraid of an obstacle. God keeps His promises even though it may not happen according to our timing. God can do it. You see, it was at God's appointed time this son came, not at Abraham and Sarah's appointed time, was it? They would have had it happen a lot earlier. But God has His timetable. God keeps His promises, even though it may be preceded by tears of frustration or struggle. God can do it. God keeps His promises, even though the journey to the fulfillment might be a... a, be a hard one in your life and in my life. But never forget, we serve a God who keeps every single promise He makes. And if you're a child of God this morning, you serve the same faithful God that Abraham and Sarah served. Gods haven't changed. We're reading a story that happened a long, long time ago in human history. Several thousand years ago, we're reading of these events. But... We serve the same God. Yes, His promises to you and I are different than promises made to them. I don't expect to have a child at age 100. Had enough kids. But God hasn't made that promise to me. God, every promise in the Bible isn't made to you and I personally. But yet He's made us promises. But whatever promise God makes, if it applies to you and me, He will faithfully bring it to pass. Let's rehearse just a few of those as we end our time today. I've I've just picked a few 
promises, some broad promises in the New Testament to those who are people of faith. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, the Son of God said, Therefore everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. If I confess Christ, I can depend on Jesus confessing me before the Father. That's a promise Jesus will keep as the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of a God who keeps His promises, so Jesus will keep His promises. He promises to confess my name if I confess His. In John, whoops, back up. John 6, verse 51. The Gospel of John is full of promises made to the people of God. John 6, 51 says, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down of heaven out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. In context there, that's not a reference to the Lord's Supper, I I believe. It's a reference to Jesus saying, you've got to believe in me. You've got, if you will, to consume me by faith to have life. And he says, if anyone eats me, you will live. Later in John 8, 51, this time Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone... So these are, these are widespread promises. Anybody, Jesus says, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. So Jesus has to be talking there about spiritual death, right? Because there's been faithful people throughout history who have died physically. But that doesn't mean they're lost eternally. If I'm faithfully endeavoring to keep the Word of God, Jesus promises I will never die. That, that's spiritual death. I'm alive forever as a child of God, and you are too, spiritually. If I'm endeavoring to keep His Word, God, Jesus can keep that promise. John 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone comes through me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Sounds a lot like what Jesus said in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If anyone comes to the Father through me, that's salvation. Anybody who enters through Jesus has the promised salvation that God makes. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him. There's a promise of God and his Son. For anybody, if we love God, he'll love us. Then James chapter 1, verse 12. James says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So if we bear up under trial, not surrendering surrendering our faith, we have the promise of the crown of life promised by God, promised by the Lord. That's a promise God will keep. Finally, Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Probably all of you could rehearse it by memory. Remember on the day of Pentecost, Peter said to the crowd who cried out, what must I do? What must we do to be saved? They'd just been convicted of the fact that they'd crucified the Messiah God had sent to them. Who wouldn't throw up their hands and say, what am I going to do now? Peter says, Repent each one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call to Himself. God, there promises the gift of the Spirit, the presence of God for those who submit to Him in faith. That's a promise God will keep. But it is a conditional promise, isn't it? It is for anyone, though, who will turn to God in faith, repent, and be immersed into Christ, in the name of Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins.
And that's a great place to end today because that's God's call in your life and my life. If you are a Christian, then you've taken these steps. You followed the example of, of the way Jesus and the apostles taught. But if you're not a child of God, if you haven't repented and been baptized according to the Bible, then God can't keep this promise for you. God won't give His Spirit to those who haven't submitted in faith. So that's His call this morning for those who aren't part of God's family. I would encourage you to, to take those steps. If you need more study about it, we can do that. But think clearly about the, the blessing of serving a God who keeps every promise He has ever made and ever will make to you. God... His promises are certain. They're timely. They call for a response in our life often. God says, if you do this, I will do this. But imagine the joy you can have knowing that your sins have been forgiven, that you have the eternal life that Jesus promised God would give you, the crown of life itself that you can wear before the throne of God eternally. Think about that as we stand and sing.